I get a chance to talk with Ben O'Connor. We've spoken a couple of times, I think actually once on the record, when it was just when you signed your contract for yeah, Dimension right. Data. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's learn a little bit more about you and your experiences. Uh, should we rip straight into the collarbone at the Giro? Sure, I think it's probably like the most outstanding, <laughs> the most lasting memory, I guess. It's yeah. probably like uh, affected me. <laughs> it was, uh, it actually, it really did sort of come at a terrible time because you were flying and it seemed for, from afar that you were going to be top 10 in the Giro. I mean, I already knew I was going to be, I'd already heard that Rowan was a long, long way back and I know Conrad had been dropped and I guess all, I was with all the rivals that were just in front of me, between, I guess, like a, eight to ten or like seven to ten and then all the other guys have been dropped so uh the fact that i lost it right at the end for no reason i guess it was uh i mean heart i mean it's always going to be heartbreaking but like just it's just like a big sucker punch because you made no mistake you were never brash and then at one time it's where uh it's where the lack of experience i think got to me that's why oh. So you put it down to a personal mistake? Yeah, well, because I didn't need to be on the forefront because I had no, either no right or no role to then chase the, the people in front of me because mm -hmm. that wasn't my race. My race is with the guys that had already been dropped and the one or two guys that were still in this group but hurting, uh, whether it be um, George Bennett or, or once again Conrad or Bill Bow. So I didn't, they weren't going to be going anywhere on this descent. I was never going to get in front. They were never going to get dropped. So okay. it was it was just super frustrating. And a good example was actually uh, then actually uh, Patrick Conrad came up to me in Tour of Poland, um, my first World Tour race back. And he's like, um, "Fuck, man, I was trying to come up to you guys, to you and say like, calm down. Like you don't need to. You don't need to. Like he's like you just like just sit back and just wait." So when he, when he told me that, I was like, wow, it's even more of a sucker punch because then I know other people were thinking it. It's not like I was shouting at people, but no. I didn't need to race. Okay. I only had to race when I got to the final, to that Bardonecchia finale, the, the finish. I didn't need to uh, to do anything uh, before then. No. So uh, it's gone. It's passed. <laughs> I know. Ones. I know I've learned as long as I don't do it again. Yeah. Well, it's a sliding doors moment, but it's also, like you say, you got to learn from it and move on. Yeah, I mean, sliding doors and also opening doors, because it's completely opened my mind to what I can do for, I guess, racing in the future, what I can look to try and do maybe one day. You were a little bit of an anomaly for the team last year because we were looking for victory photos for the poster in the Tour de France guide, and you were pretty much the only bloke from your team to win a race before June. Yeah, yeah, besides I think Cav maybe won a stage at Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would definitely mean for our team it was not a good year at all. Um, and for uh, some of the men that were meant to be racing super well, then they were never able to kind of get to that, that level that they would normally be at. So, I mean, it's like, I guess, frustration on all levels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And do you feel like you're slowly becoming an old hand or are you still got uh, like a, you know, a stars in your eyes? No, no, definitely not new, uh, definitely not old hand. Cause it feels like you've, you've stepped into new territory. You were still in Neo Pro before. Um, now you have that whole new, like I said, like essentially pack of cards. You have a whole new deck of responsibility, of leadership and I guess of dedicated targets. You always have targets when you're, I guess it was last year because I had such good shape, but now that it's a lot more specific, um, it doesn't mean there's like crazy pressure because it's not like you're uh, Dual Milan or someone like Roglic or whatever, but you still have, okay, these are the races that you have to be very good at. You have to be good at them kind of thing. But the pressure comes from me, not from the, the team because it, if you're, if you're a motivated athlete, it doesn't need to be the team's pressure that gets you into shape. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you should worry, because it should only be yourself. Uh, there's a new uh, staff member on your um, 
payroll or your team's payroll in 2019 is an Australian and he's helping with um, well-being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about him and his impact on you at the training camp, for example? Did you get some spend some time with him? Yeah, I mean, I've spoken to David and uh, he's, I mean, he's another Australian and I guess it's <laughs> always good to have kind of common ground or common knowledge between how you kind of interact with people. Um, I think half the time he's just actually in your head how either motivation in terms of driven you are or even over motivated a lot of the time mm -hmm. the guys that just get into either traditional methods of either doing too much or uh, even just normal struggles at home I mean for for example me an Australian a young Australian moved out when I was as a neo pro for the first time out of home mm -hmm. to live in Europe that's still a big kind of, I guess, mental and psychological kind of battle because where do you actually want to live? Probably want to live in Australia still. It's a wicked country. Why would you, why would you not want to? But Europe has to be home. So that whole, that whole fact of the matter is that you need to make that uh, work, I guess. So. And so what did you do? Where are you based? And what's your setup? Have you got a girlfriend? Or? I'm in Girona. Yeah. A lot of Australians are. I was in Luca. I think when I first spoke to you, I was saying I was going to be going to Luca, but uh, I just couldn't make it work with, uh, I guess, the traffic. Uh, the, 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 it was just very dangerous on the road. You spend hours on the road each uh, each day, each year. Um, so you shouldn't take any more risks than you should. Mm. It's already a dangerous sport. Mm. Why make it more? Um, my girlfriend visited a lot last year, and I think it actually makes a huge difference. Um, I guess someone having either control over you or actually having your best friend and also the person that you might love yeah. to live with you is, I mean, it, it, you, can't, you can't beat it at all. So I think that was one of the major points of, 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 of success. And it's actually ironic. I was saying that my, every single time she came over, she came over before I won my stage of uh, Austria in my first year in Neopro like the month before um, and then was there February, April and then just before and, and yeah, February and April last year yep. between uh, my period of good racing mm -hmm. and then after that um, kind of when I was trying to recover. So I guess pretty much all my kind of good moments tend to be when she was there. To be a a pro cyclist or any pro athlete, I suppose, you have to be pretty selfish. Are you selfish enough to be uber successful? I, I think so. I, I, mean, I don't know. It's also hard to say because I hate the, I hate that term. I fucking hate it because then you just seem like such a dick. Yeah. But no, I think just all I found in my second year was the biggest thing I got out was completely balance. Is a balance between training, between living, between eating. The whole combination of every single thing always came down to to balance. You can have wine, but it doesn't mean you have a a bottle each day mm -hmm. or four bottles a week. Just like kind of like tailor it down. You can go have a pizza twice a week if you really like that stuff. But I mean, it, it's just that whole thing of being in the middle. It didn't need to be all or nothing. Yeah, That's cool. what worked a lot nicer for me um, if I did all or nothing then it was pretty much that it was great until you jumped off the cliff interesting when we spoke upon signing of the contract this may sound insulting but I'm going to go with it mm -hmm. but it got I got the feeling that you were so concerned about your weight that it was a little bit dangerous Man, territory. I was, yeah, I was super skinny. I was the skinniest I've been ever. Um, I, I don't know what I was, 65? Yeah, it was the skinniest I, I've ever, ever been. And it was verging, as you said, just then on problems. Most certainly, definitely was December, January. Okay. Um, I, I came here, and it's funny, because I, I was like, I was starting to get almost self-conscious. Um, it was, always, it was biting me back, essentially. I'd been eating virtually nothing and really trying to, like, having very little, I guess, in terms of that whole carbohydrate thing. And I got here, and they had the buffet, and I was just going to town on it. And the guys are taking the piss, being like, oh, you eat so much. 
but I was super skinny, super, super skinny. But I guess I never, I didn't get that, I guess that break from home because I was at home the whole time and I was still young and you're crazy motivated and it just got way out of hand. And I remember coming here and I just chomped on everything I could. And I'd, I'd be with Lockie maybe in the room and he might have like a beer or like a whole block of chocolate. And he'd be like, yeah, I'll go have another snack. Why not? And then I just have another huge, yeah. So that's Lockie Morton. Yeah. Okay. So it was it was super funny, and as, I'm I'm happy you brought that up because uh, it was just a it was a stupid thing. I just I can't even imagine doing that now. Uh, It'd be one of those things where you go to the fridge and you open it, yeah. and then say it like out loud, "No, no, I can't, I can't." Close the fridge, you go back upstairs, you do it again, you go back up. <laughs> this is shocking. Fuck. <laughs> It's gone. It's yeah. gone. <laughs> What's your go-to food now if you sort of feel like snacking? Like, and you... Yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> eat way too much yogurt. No, I do... I mean, I love fruit just in general. I tend to eat healthy just in general. I don't I often like uh, crazy snacks. Actually, that's where it gets a bit too far gone, like goji berries or peanut butter. It's really healthy, yeah. nice snacking food. But I love it so much that you end up having like, tons of it. <laughs> But yeah, that's probably my favorite kind of snacks. Even like just at home, uh, especially in Spain, just jamón. Okay. Jamón with melon. Yeah, that's a good so snack. A little bit of olive oil. I mean, it feels authentic just in general. Right. You can sit on the balcony. You can listen to the people downstairs or outside. And then you're in Spain and you get to have jamón and melon. I think that's kind of a good balance because cause then you get like some good internal feels from being uh, yeah. Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a dietary uh, enhancement, but it's also a cultural reference point. Cultural trip, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I like it. That's cool. <laughs> uh, and what about nuts or what? What sort of is there advice coming from the team about what's good to be to manage your diet? Does your coach get involved with that, or you just we sort of have feel a nutritionist now working with us? Yeah. Um, but it, like, obviously, you need to feel because I mean training you can burn a lot more than what you think sometimes or a lot less than we actually uh, yeah, okay. kind of should um no i mean we were getting sidetracked but with reason you know you're talking about how you used to be and that wasn't that long ago no and then you suddenly realize hey if i eat i'll probably feel a lot better yeah and i mean ten, it worked as well in general my weight's definitely more than what it was when i was a neo pro in terms of my first year um clearly have a lot more power than I did then just from general kind of development I guess into being at least somewhat I don't really look like a man but at least I've probably grown to look more like one than before because I was a super baby faced still am but it was a lot more when I first turned pro <laughs> if we're going to look at aesthetics uh, or talk about aesthetics I wonder if I can pay you the compliment of you look fantastic on the bike. You look relaxed when you're down at the drops. You seem to have a nice straight back. Yeah, I, I actually changed a little bit compared to when I was, once again, starting. I was very stretched out, very long. Okay. I brought up a lot shorter. And also, it's ironic. With uh, the frame size or stem size? Or how did you Stem manage? size. You didn't pull um, your saddle forward or anything? That did go forward as well. Okay. Because I was a long way back. I was over 100 mils back which is a lot and I was already 130 okay. in front and um, what's the differences in them or now that with the change the BMC I've got a 57 with a 120 no with a 130 stem and then I think my sales setbacks around 80 okay so you pulled it forward about 20 mil yeah fair chunk also because the with the sales now I'm using it tend to have a cutout so uh, okay. just to so you actually sit in the groove rather than um, just sitting on the on the edge of the saddle, uh, so that there was, the, and also the other thing that happened was that my uh, my saddle dropped one day when I was training in the Dolomites, but I didn't realise, no idea. Went from eighty three to eighty two, um, and I felt I felt great, and we got to the race, and then uh, I, I looked at it, and they're like, oh look, it's smaller. Um, I'm like, oh, I've had no idea. We'll just keep it. And then at Tour Austria, my first year, I won the stage. So I was like, oh, I'll just keep it. So my okay. cell dropped to centimeter purely just by, I guess, coincidence. 
Um, but I've had no knee troubles now at all um, and it hasn't changed my performance. If not, it's probably made it better. So, Because you uh, elicit more power? Maybe. Maybe. No idea. I just know I didn't even notice the difference. Okay. Um, and I feel that it just felt fine. So Interesting. Because I I think... that was when we're talking about bike position, I was going to say, yesterday watching the crit, when they're coming past, it feels like no one has strong leg extension anymore. It's like they're all really quite low. Yeah, a lot are quite low, I guess. I mean, unless they took it from Steve <laughs> or Ed Bowl. They've got crazy low saddle positions. Steve Cummings. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I, I guess maybe it's just the change in what the biomechanics, like the, what the true biomechanics of power can do. I mean, maybe it was always traditional that had to be, I guess, like a longer extension, but... I don't know. Anyone can do anything. Valverde is quite a long, uh, quite a high saddle height. Yeah. So, I mean, that's counter to what we were just saying then. So, yeah. I mean, it, people can do what they like. As long as it works for you, mm. then it's then it's all good. But in terms of my position, you feel a hell of a lot more comfortable now and it can descend normally a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to restart the conversation with that. We don't have to go back there. We'll yeah, yeah. Move on. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bygones are bygones. It hurts. Uh, um, it, it's interesting with all of the science that exists, you know, and you've got well-being officers and nutritionists and a whole raft of staff that can look after different things, and then suddenly you find a position because your saddle slipped. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I guess I didn't really have any too many specific kind of bike position kind of build-ups because I didn't really. I've had them before, and I really didn't like how they set me up. They usually they used to be, and originally it was always quite long, mm-hmm. but since going shorter, you feel a hell of a lot more stable. And I'm definitely not upright at all. I can get myself quite flat. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're an athlete. You tend to be able to, I guess, manage things or be, I guess, some people are adaptable. Some cannot adapt to anything. But, mm-hmm. I mean, your body moves. You can get, <laughs> it's flexible. <laughs> sure. So, uh, do we see you make your Tour de France debut this year? Probably not. Oh. I'll do uh, I'll do the Giro again. That's my main my main goal, my main program. If maybe all goes super well, perhaps. But uh, I still don't think there's any need to rush. I mean, the Giro is the unfinished business that I need to do first. Okay. And then what comes after that is, so far, a little bit unknown. It'll either be if you're incredibly lucky, then maybe you do the tour, but you'll probably most likely then be doing uh, Love Welter. I think it's super conducive to riding. I was in Sydney end of November and it was pretty shit to ride there. Yeah. If you go near Mosman and to Ronga Zoo, it was nice, yeah. but to you try and get, get to that Royal National Park was a pain. I was staying in Millers Point and getting there was just awful. Yeah. Oh, I mean, purse leaps and bounds above. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And what, I mean, let's conclude with a little, uh, maybe an anecdote, if you have one, about club life. You know, as in, not nightclubs, but the, 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 the um, grassroots of cycling. I, um, I get the feeling that there's, because of what you've just explained, the fact that Perth is a little bit more accessible for the cyclist than Sydney is, for example there would be a healthy, vibrant club scene or what's it like over there? It's kind of, it's funny because it's actually a mixture because you have people who like kind of complain where maybe there's not enough racing on and then they might put the races on and not that many people turn up, mm-hmm. but a lot of people ride. So it's an interesting club scene where they try and kind of find the balance between getting like the normal races, as in like the handicaps, the uh, like Kalgoorlie one or the Collie the Donnybrook, stuff like that. Okay. Um, you then also have Tour of Margaret River down south, which is a huge event for for, for amateurs to, I guess, be part of a, a multi-stage kind of event in a beautiful area with a relaxed kind of way. So maybe that's a better way to go about it now to have, I guess, those those multi kind of Grand Fondo-ish kind of kind of events um, because. People like like racing crits, but they're not always super popular. Uh, 
hey, thanks for catching up. It's a pleasure just to hear a little bit more about what's going on in your life. And uh, long may you eat uh, hummus and uh, watermelon. Uh, no, I'm gonna eat. And, oh, uh, I actually could do some watermelon. It's too hot today. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's good to see you looking healthy and feeling healthy and being happy. Yeah, I am. So, cheers. Thank you very much. All the best for the season. Thanks, man. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs>